What's up, desktopers? Xavier Wills here for Desktop Bodybuilding, and today I'm back with another one on one interview. And today I'm joined by Stuart Sutherland. He's competing in the New York Pro in just 11 days' time. Man, I've actually been saying it's your pro debut, but it's not. You actually competed last year in the Tampa Pro. And yeah. I even covered that show, and I completely forgot because you got the hair now, you've got basically <laughs> a completely different look. But, man, how does it feel being 11 days out of your, you know, essentially what you want to be? your pro debut is probably what you see as your pro debut. Yeah. I call it a rookie season start or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like, I'd love to have a mulligan on the Tampa. I kind of screwed some things up with that show, but I honestly, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Like I was just telling you earlier, uh, this prep has been real smooth for me. Uh, me and my coach blue are like just on the same page at this point. And we got a playbook down pretty good. Um, kind of refined things last year and it's just been like a dress rehearsal this time honestly so um i'm i haven't gotten below 250 so far i think i started prepping like 282 um wow. so i've come down pretty far I've, I've been right around like the low mid 250s though for the last three or four weeks i think um yeah just kind of, you know, getting a little, little harder, a little, you know, a little better each, each week. So, um, how tall are you, man? I, uh, I'm about five foot eight, um, you know, five ten with the hair, but, uh, it don't really count. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, because, oh, sorry, I'll just adjust this. I'm trying to still work all this stuff out, but, um, Dude, like, I actually assumed you were a shorter bodybuilder just based on your individual photos because, like... You know you why? Like a... Look, I, I know exactly why. Let me explain this. I have a theory, okay? So, I have a very big head. It's not just the, the <laughs> wig-looking thing. Like, I have a really big noggin. And you kind of, like, subconsciously, when you look at somebody, you're like, okay, you judge the size of their body based on the size of their head, relatively speaking, which is why, like... You look at Flex Lewis, he looks like he's got a giant head, but he's like 5'4", right? I, I got that same issue, but I'm not that short. <laughs> it just looks like it. So yeah, that's my theory, like, at least. Um, <laughs> well, you probably look balanced, man, because most bodybuilders, like you look at like Mikel Crizo and guys like that, they look like they've almost got like a pinhead, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, but like they look freaky like on their own, right? You know, just standing there alone. And I kind of have the opposite effect. Like I look less big in pictures than I do in person because big old head basically. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. That's so you're my story doing... and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> you're obviously doing New York, which is a, a huge show. In the last few years, we haven't seen the greatest lineups in terms of New York Pro. Now, I don't want to discredit anyone for winning them or anything like that, but they've been, in terms of just overall competitors, how many there's been in the show and it seems like a lot of people leave it to the Chicago Pro and things like that. Is that the reason why you chose to do the New York pro or is it because of the prestige? What was the reason? Um, I did the New York because Steve told me to do the New York. It was the first thing he said when I got off stage at the USA. He's like, do New York. That's all he says. Doesn't even say hi. Um, and so, okay, I'm doing New York. That was nine, nine months ago now, uh, end of July last year. So, um, you know, I kind of had like a brief off season. I've probably been able to put on like five or six pounds, like solid pounds in that time frame. Though it was pretty productive. Um, you know, like like you were talking about earlier, uh, I won the USA, and then I went to Tampa the next weekend. I had no illusions that I was like Derek Lunsford or anything. I wasn't going there to like win or nothing. I just wanted to see what I looked like in the lineup, you know, next to the big guys because. Um, I just wanted that perspective, you know, like what's, what's shitty on me? What do I need to fix in this time frame before I do like my, you know, my first legit pro show, um, where I'm, you know, in the mix and I need to put a lot of tissue on my back and on my arms. Uh, I, I did improve my arms quite a bit. My back still needs to be a bit wider, but, um, I definitely have a lot more thickness up and down my spine now been doing the deadlifts, um. So you know, it was it was a short but productive nine months. I think um, I should have a, a little bit more tissue to show for in that after that. 
Absolutely. And and your latest physique update, as people saw on the screen just before, you're looking really, really good. You've actually got some photos as well, which I'll share on the screen in a second, um, but you've put up and you're looking, man, phenomenal. And we obviously got to see you next to Hunter Labrada, uh, guest posing. I can't remember what show that was at, but that made everyone stand up. And the first photo I saw was, it was, I always take into account like what angle the photo's from. And the first photo I saw, it was angled to favor you. And I was like, maybe it's just the angle you know maybe it's mm. maybe it's not that close but then i saw a photo from the other side and i was like this guy's legit like he, he looks <laughs> great and obviously hunters you know 13 14 weeks out whatever he is now how much confidence does that give you standing next to a guy who's finished fourth in the olympia two years ago to seeing yourself stand next to him on a bodybuilding stage well you know it, again it's it's like one pose different points in prep all of these caveats. Right. But like, it's a, it's, it was a really cool measuring stick. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I held my own next to him, you know, there's certain things that like, you don't really know until you're standing next to each other. Like how wide are your shoulders? You know, how mm. big are your body parts in comparison to the guy standing next to you? Um, and you know, I didn't really know that until I was, I was there. That's that's one of the reasons I did Tampa last year. I wanted to see what I look like next to bigger guys. Um, but yeah, you know, like I I think I will fit in in an open lineup. And you know, sometimes guys will get pro cards because you know they're they got a lot of muscularity, they got a lot of conditioning, but they don't have like everything flowing together or whatever. And then they get to a pro stage and they're like you know, you just don't really have a shot at ever being like a top call out there because it just doesn't fit together. And there's like certain things that you just don't have. Right. But, you know, I saw that and standing next to him and I was like, okay, the, I've got the tools here at least to in a few years, hopefully get to a pretty good level in this sport. So it, it was really cool. And I obviously got a lot of attention too, which was, which was nice. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that, that picture up there was up in uh, Portland. So my coach Blue uh, lives up in Portland, uh, and he I just flew up there for a day, like left in the morning, came back in the evening because he wanted to see me in person. Because um, you know pictures don't always tell the whole story, right? Uh, and he was really happy with with what I look like. You know, I keep in mind I, this is like the middle of the day after training, just got off a plane an hour ago, so I'm not like dry here, but. Um, you know, like I was, I was saying earlier, fat's basically gone at this point. I got to make some chemical changes basically and just kind of land the plane. Um, so, you know, if he's happy, I'm happy. And I'm a lot more like relaxed now knowing that like the, most of the work is done. Can I start backing off on cardio and just relaxing a bit more on training, um, and just cruise in. Um, yeah. I've kind of been ahead of schedule throughout this whole prep. That's kind of how things tend to go for me. Like once I start coming down from like that mid 280 mark and just like my body weight just drops quick. Um, uh, this, this year I did a good job of maintaining a lot of my performance and stuff in the gym. Um, so I wasn't like shrilling up or anything as my weight was dropping quick, but uh, I hit a good stride and then again, in striking distance sort of ahead of time. And then we just kind of, refine things from there so yeah a few questions i want to ask off that man obviously i want to ask about your coach blue um but you mentioned mm -hmm. obviously your performance has stayed higher during your prep has that been a focus for you to try to maintain that because i've done i'm just thinking of the two last preps i've done or actually mm -hmm. the three last ones and when the performance has been down you typically notice your physique you know it makes sense that it correlates but Sometimes you think, oh, the weight's not that important or whatever, but I definitely notice a flatter look, not as round, not as full, not as, you know, that hard graininess when I'm, the performance hasn't been to the same level. So how important is that? And I suppose, how do you incorporate that and discuss that with your coach, Blue? Well, so the first year I prepped with him in 21, um, the, I, I mean, straight up, we just kind of over dieted for that show. That was the first time he'd really gotten me in like proper condition and uh you know my strength went through the fucking floor <laughs> in in that uh prep um now i rebounded out of that show really well and because i was so lean there i was i was flat and stringy and I, I didn't like the like it was uh, my body looked beat up 
Um, yep. But I rebounded out of that. And then last year when I did the USA is like, I don't know. I, we just did a much better job of like, you know, pushing for conditioning, getting flat, getting a little leaner and then refeeding when performance started to like go. And, you know, I started to get really flat for too long. And for me, at least, you know, everybody's different, but it's kind of a balancing act between like pushing for a few days, uh, but not too long. So, Cause if I start to overdo it, I just kind of wither away. I got a fast metabolism. Like I was a skinny kid growing up. Um, so I, we, I gotta be careful. Um, whereas other people, you know, they can just hammer themselves with cardio and no food and they're not going to shrink. Um, but they struggle to get in shape. Whereas it's a lot easier for me. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, um, you know, managing, I train with pretty low volume and managing that, like the amount of training volume that I'm doing, um, during a prep is really important in being able to maintain, you know, my, my performance on compound lift, like my presses and my, my squat movements and my deadlift. Um, I think also I've just had like this muscle on me a little bit longer now than in the past. Uh, so, you know, newer muscle tends to kind of fall off quicker uh, when you really get in good shape. Uh, but it's been on me for a little longer now. So I think it's kind of stuck better. So makes yeah, sense. Sure. Now, I wanted to talk about Blue as well, your coach. Now, I know who Blue Taylor is because I've seen him online. I've seen like interview type stuff with him as well. Um, but mm -hmm. tell us a bit about Blue and who he is and, and what his, I suppose, his philosophies in terms of you know, training, prepping and all that sort of stuff is. Because I can see here, you, it seems like you're into the, the hardcore type training, doing the deadlifts off the floor here, which is something you don't always see these days. Yeah, so he, he actually kind of lets me run my own training um, because I, he, I, when I started with him over two years ago now, and basically I'm I like what I've been doing, you know, it's been working for me for a little while and he's like, okay, I'm just gonna run your diet, your, you know, subs and everything. And, um, and you know, I haven't fixed it cause it hasn't been broken pretty much. I've made some, you know, modifications to my split here and there, but, um, the style is, was kind of like lower volume, high intensity, stuff that I've been doing for like five or six years now. Um, but, uh, yeah, blue, blue is really, He's really, when it, when it comes to prepping people, I'd say that he generally tends to run them on the flatter side and the more conditioned side than like, you know, bring guys in full and big and round. Um, like a Patrick with, Tua type coach. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, Patrick does, I don't know. He's, I'm not really familiar with a lot of Patrick's athletes now that I'm thinking about it. I mean, he probably prepped um, like Ian Valier and uh, he probably oh, yeah. Aaron Polites, who was who was peeled to the bone. Oh yeah, yeah. Two twelve. Um, yeah, he's he's, got, he's got, had quite a few. Uh, obviously, previously prepped James Hollingshead and whatnot as well. Um, but mm -hmm. he sort of a few people said, oh, he, he flattens the guys out too much. But I'm like, well, overall, like his athletes probably coming better than the average athlete, you know? Yeah, and you know, I think people kind of we're bodybuilders right we like being big but you got to get flat to get in shape it's as simple as that exactly you can't overdo it but like most people if you've never been peeled before you just gotta suffer and like get skinny and wear a hoodie and not look at yourself for weeks on end and not um, care yeah you just gotta disconnect from it um and that was the, that was hard the first prep i ever did with blue because he was pushing me way harder than he has in you know this year's prep or last year's prep um, but you know, I did that once I got in really good shape once and getting back to that condition or a little better each time has just been really, really straightforward, um, working mm. with him, um, with, you know, that, that was my, my, my first prep, we kind of overdid the diet, I think. Um, but you know, last year and this year we've, like I was saying, we kind of figured out a formula as far as like maintaining uh, strength and fullness when needed uh so that i don't overdo it you know um because yeah. he knows that my I, my body's kind of fragile for lack of a better term um so we just have to balance stuff it seems like more guys now have that crazy metabolism where 
you know, it, it's almost like on a knife's edge. Like if you push too hard in terms of your diet, like, you know, if you stay flat for too many days in a row, then your physique mm -hmm. can sort of get away with you. And we saw that with James Hollingshead, especially when was it not the last Olympia but one prior where he said he wasn't yeah. telling that's when he's working with Patrick actually. And he said he, he wasn't necessarily informing Patrick of how he was feeling. And Patrick is always going to uh, err on the side of conditioning over mass and just his physique push, really, push, push, yeah. yeah. And his physique really got away from him. And it seems like a more common thing nowadays because it seemed like the guys back in the nineties, early two thousands, I remember even early days when I started following bodybuilding, which was probably, 18 years ago now, now I think about it when I was 15 or so, it seemed like mm -hmm. these guys could push and get in condition and it never seemed to be an issue where they were flattening out too much compared to now. And I'm wondering, is it is it just because overall there's more bigger guys now where I you think know, it, obviously yeah. you've got more muscle, I think it's more just a, fast metabolism? I think it's just a size thing, honestly. Like yeah. the number of guys, so like think about 93 dorian right what was he like mid 250s on stage and he was gigantic yeah. by the standards back then that's like the average open pro now right so you know they, there's just more muscle um i don't think they're necessarily abusing drugs more you know the guys in the 90s like to say they took bikini girl cycles and i think they're all full of shit personally but um like i, I, the, I the, there's just we know a little bit more about nutrition now. Uh, you know, we take, I, I at least, and a lot of other guys take their off seasons really seriously. You know, a guy like Ian Vayer, uh, I was talking with it about this on bro chat. Like he's never off a plan in the off season. He's always force feeding himself. Um, and you know, it's a ton of food and it builds up your metabolism to the point where you can recover from a lot of training and a lot of like heavy weights that you're moving in the off season. And then, you know, you start trimming things away from that, shitload of food that you're eating when you start a prep and it's just like things just start you know it's just starts coming off of you you're still eating enough where you're strong and full for like you know 70 80 percent of the prep so you get to the dog end but like yeah I, I, people just have more tissue nowadays you know like 20 30 pounds on average more um compared to the, the guys in the 90s um and they, they tended to favor a flatter look back then. You know, I think they they definitely used more diuretics back in the 90s. You know, um, they tended to come in drier, but also a bit flatter. You know, that's that's my opinion, at least looking at the pictures and like the physiques from back then. Um, yeah, I agree. You know, it, it wasn't there wasn't as much emphasis on just pure mass. I mean, obviously, Dorian was winning and he was he was a big, big dude with a ton of density, but there mm -hmm. was never uh, you know, Dorian did say that he thinks he maybe dieted down a little bit too hard, but he still seemed to have that pop to the muscle and enough of that density. But it seems like now if like a big Rami comes in too flat, it seems like he really doesn't have that pop or something. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know if it's maybe there's more insulin usage now. I don't, I don't know what it is. And plus obviously more muscle overall on average. So you look at the guys yeah. and you go, well, on average, it seems like guys come in flat if they, if they push it too hard. So I, I don't know what the exact thing is. I think it's a combination of everything. I think everyone likes to point their finger at one specific thing, but I think it's probably a combination. And you're probably right because in terms of the usage and how much guys use, because I've heard, you know, you hear all, all the nineties guys, and I'm sure there's some of them that are genetic anomalies, like your flex wheelers and whatnot, that probably didn't, weren't smashing uh, the levels of stuff that guys do nowadays. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I've still heard stories from behind the scenes because, you know, being well connected with people saying, oh, this guy used to do this and he used to smash this many orals. And you're like, whoa, that's even a lot by today's yeah. standards. So. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think there's this uh, kind of mythos that we have about the guys in the 90s. It's like this was the greatest era of bodybuilding ever. And they just worked harder and dieted harder and they trained harder and they were just better. You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. It's like your dad saying, I walked uphill both ways to school in the morning every day, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> everything the was distance just gets longer and longer the more they tell the distance gets yeah, longer yeah, the more they tell the story was, and it gets less dry the longer time goes on for the nineties. It's class. raining fire down and yeah, you know. <laughs> I I, I, I kind of just hear that stuff and chuckle because like I I think it's just kind of older guys shitting on younger guys saying we're all lazy. Uh, mm -hmm. and we're not, you know, I think the game is just different now. Um, yeah. everybody has more tissue. Um, everybody is generally bigger and fuller. 
um, you know, on stage because you just don't get looked at if, if you're not, you know, in the 240 plus range, unless you're somebody crazy looking like, I don't know, Justin Shire, you know, who's just got wacky proportions and you look 20 pounds bigger than you really are. Um, yeah. unless you're somebody like that or like Tony O'Burton where you just look twice as big as you actually weigh. Like, I mean, I, I don't have those bells and whistles personally. Like I got a, I had, I knew from the get go, I was going to be, if I was going to be competitive as a pro, I was going to be in the two fifties, you know? Um, yeah. and the, I I've, I've gotten there. I definitely need to continue to refine the look at this weight, you know? get more muscle maturity, continue to improve my conditioning, all that stuff that you do over the course of years. But um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of a different game now, I think. What way would you like to see bodybuilding go? Because obviously you can't blame the guys of today for bringing in these ultra full looks where it might sacrifice a little bit in terms of conditioning or it might sacrifice a bit in terms of, you know, keeping that physique really streamlined. Would you like to see it go more of the way of, how it used to be in terms of judging, in terms of like just bringing that razor sharp conditioning, more focus on the aesthetics rather than the level of mass that guys are required to have today to do well in shows. Like which way would you like to see it go? I think so. No, I'm, I can't really comment on condition, but like if you look at the, the Olympia lineup and who did well this year at the Olympia, uh, it was a lot of shape guys. You know, you had Andrew in there, you had um, Samson, you had Derek Lunsford. Hottie is a very big guy, but he's also got, like, really good silhouette, and, uh, you know, he flows very well. Um, Do you know what's funny? I actually heard he, someone say the, say the other day that they reckon Hardy's blocky. I'm like, he's not really blocky. His waist isn't big. Like, he, to me, he looks yeah. pretty aesthetic for a guy that's that height, that has that level yeah. of muscularity, so... Yeah, very. Right. Yeah, very much so. I mean, mm. he does have a wider waist, but his quads are so goddamn big. It doesn't matter, um, you know, exactly. compared to like Derek Lunsford. Right. But uh, generally speaking, the guys who are doing well are quite aesthetic and they're also very big. Um, yeah. I think that would I, I would like to see more of that. Uh, plus conditioning, you know, you, I, I, I think they made a fine decision at the Arnold this year giving it to Samson. But, you know, he looked like he was four or five weeks out, in my opinion, uh, conditioning yeah. wise. And, you know, maybe that's just as hard as that guy can ever get. You know, he's in his late 30s now. He's been training for a long time. That was his best condition that we've ever seen on him. And it still was like, uh, you know, kind of an Akeem Williams kind of look, you know, a little thicker skin. But there was so much muscle there and flow and shape and all the other stuff that, you know, I understand why they gave it to him. Um, and it's quite funny I with mean, Samson, man. Sorry to interrupt you, but Samson, yep. like, you lock his quad out, completely straighted out of quads. Like, when you actually look at it, you see, like, a long way up. And then he turns to the back, the glutes aren't there as much, and the back's not quite as crisp. But then it's quite funny. You mentioned Akeem Williams. You know, he's got certain body parts, like the outer quad and the hamstring, and he's got body parts that look peeled, insane. But then you look through his delts and his back and it looks like a guy that's, like you said, five weeks out or six weeks out. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's to look at these guys, odd, I'm like, yeah. how do you judge that conditioning? I'm like, I guess overall you judge it as looking two weeks out or something. I don't know. It's it's unusual. Yeah. Could, well, you know, what really happens is like Chris Aceto would say, it's it just turns into a glutes and ham show. So like if you're softer up top in your back, but you got striated glutes and crazy hamstrings. I mean, Samson's kind of funny. He's got like really deep cuts in his hamstrings. Those are really hard. And then his glutes are yeah. just smooth. You know, they're lean, but they're not like, you know, chopped up, you know? Mm. Um, so, I mean, I think that's just kind of a genetic thing on him. I, he yeah. still has an incredible physique. And I, I think he, uh, you know, when people throw out like the future Mr. Olympia kind of talk though with him, like you really got to be conditioned, conditioned to win an Olympia, in my opinion. I mean, the best when Brandon Curry won in what was it, 2019? Yeah, yeah. 2019. Like that was probably as conditioned as he'd ever been. Um, and, you know, since then he's brought in fuller looks. And, you know, I mean, albeit there's been other guys there as well. But I, I think he, because he has that same kind of thicker skin issue, I guess. Um, 
it's hard to give a guy a nod for an Olympia, you know, the title when you're not quite hard enough. Um, mm. But I mean, generally speaking, I would I, I like the direction the the show the the sports going in because I mean I have pretty good shape myself. I don't have like crazy body parts and wacky like arms and legs and stuff. But my flow you're is pretty balanced. good. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, I need more tissue on my back definitely, and you know, everybody in the pros has like twenty three inch arms, right? So those are always big bigger. But um, you know, I you know I've got like shape and flow and stuff. And I think that, um, that can work in my favor at some of these shows. And if I continue to get harder, the longer I compete for, um, I'm pretty happy with where my condition is going to be out for these shows, but you know, just over the course of years, it tends to get better, more muscle maturity and stuff. I think that yeah. will, that direction will favor me. Um, and also a lot of, you know, talk about like guys like Martin, I'm a huge fan of his look because, you know, wide shoulders, flaring quads, big arms, like his, his silhouette. I'm a big fan of like the silhouette guys. Like, uh, yeah. you know, Martin's a good example. Going back in time, Tom Prince, he's one of my favorite bodybuilders ever because he just oh. had like such a wacky taper, you know. Um, Man, I love that, that you mentioned that because you're that that shows like you're a student of a sport, like even at a young age. Because Tom oh, Prince, yeah, is I not, I love him. those who don't know, he 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 was a guy that you know he's sort of known for his hamstrings and his overall mass. But um, I believe he's actually passed away now, which is which is incredibly sad yeah. and unfortunate. But um, he yeah, like you said, the crazy silhouette. He was a guy that looked like he almost just about could have been Mister Olympia. But that's what you've got in this pose, and I wanted to point it out because the way you pose it the way your quads flare out off the hip as well. And also, you know, you mentioned, obviously you want to bring your arms up because everyone in the pro ranks has huge arms these days, but they've definitely have come up from what I can see. And you look at Chris Bumstead, he's, you know, classic physique, Mr. Olympia, and everyone's like, oh, hands down. And you look at yeah. his actual biceps and you're going, they're not that huge. So it's really, it's ideal to have massive arms and it's obviously helps. You see Rolly Winkler and guys like that, but overall it doesn't affect the silhouette. And I think people are more into the silhouette now. You look at Samson Dowder, he's got big arms, but they don't peak up. They're not perfect biceps or anything like that. But if you've got everything else yeah. and you're, you, you've got like the perfect X frame look there, then I think that really, you know, draws the attention away from the arms and then puts it onto the rest of your physique. And you sort of go, wow, like a Derek Lunsford, for example, he's sort of the same boat, doesn't have peaky yeah. biceps, but when he came out at that Olympia, and I was just at home yeah. watching the live stream, but when he came out and hit that front relaxed and then he hit a front Insane. double bicep, dude, yeah. I almost fell off my seat. I was <laughs> like, that, cause I thought Hardy, when he first came out, he dramatically improved after that. Cause I was like, on my live stream, I said, Hardy's off. He's probably going to be down in fourth or something. I was way wrong. Mm. But when uh, Derek Lunsford came out, it just blew my mind. I was like, that could be our next Mr. Olympia. That could be the Mr. Olympia this year. And he wasn't far off it. But uh, like you said, the conditioning level uh, to be at the top of the Olympia. Now, Derek didn't have it in terms of that razor sharp conditioning. He was in good condition for him. But yeah, like you said, it, it might be uh, a conditioning thing. But the structure here, man, it's very, very impressive. And if you can bring this in shredded and you know just keep slowly adding to it, uh, your future is, is huge. But dude, how old are you? I'm 26. I, I was on bro chat. Everybody thought I said I was 46 when I that said my age. I'm 26. I'm 26 going on 36. I know I don't look like it, but um, yeah. So I, I've i been, the last couple of years, I've been pushing pretty hard, like trying to put a lot of muscle on because like I was saying, like I knew I needed to get to like the 250s to be competitive as a pro, right? And now yeah. I don't need 10 pounds from here. I need like, two or three in the right spots. So I'm really looking forward to personally, like I got up to like 295 in my off season this year and it's awful. Like, I don't know if you've ever been that heavy before, but at five foot eight, Hell it's no. disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it, it's terrible. And so, you know, if I could get up to like a really lean 280, uh, but like continue to work on stuff like my arms and my back and the stuff that needs work, um, you know, just a couple pounds a year instead of like, seven or eight pounds a year right um you know use less less pharmaceuticals uh don't push my body weight as high take more strain off of my you know my heart and everything 
then I I'd much prefer to do that uh, in the, my off seasons going forward. Um, yeah. So that's I think that's I'm kind of getting to that point now, uh, muscle mass wise, which is a relief because you know it's been pedal the metal for a few years now. Um, yeah. And it, it gets tiring. So. Dude, I um I interviewed uh, Eric Wood yesterday, and we discussed a little bit about you know what he he does uh, to keep his waist small. He mentioned about digestion and stuff uh, and, and mm. vacuums. Dude, what have you? Do you wear a waist trainer or what? Because this looks almost like it's your waist. It looks like it's got smaller and you've added mass. Like from the Tampa Pro I, last year, I don't do this looks anything. Small. I don't I, honestly. I I have. When I was at my heaviest, I had a gut the entire time. I was force feeding the whole time. I mean, I'm 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 force feeding like chicken and rice, right? So it's easily digestible food because um, that's the only way I could get all that that those calories going through me. If I was eating bullshit, then it would just clog me up, right? But yeah, I mean, my my waist is distended for most of the off season. I've just been lucky so far. Maybe it's because I'm still young um, that it's just come down every time I've dieted. Um, mm. but you know, in the future, like I was saying, I don't want to get to that force feeding point where I'm just, you know, 290, 300 pounds miserable all the time. Um, because it's, I, I just don't think it's necessary at this point, you know, maybe getting 20, 25 pounds above my stage, stage weight's reasonable, but not 40, you know, cause that's where I was this year over 40 pounds north of it. So a lot of, yeah. you know, that's probably like 78 pounds of water a couple pounds of shit in your colon <laughs> like it's it's just like <laughs> crap you know um and you're carrying that around all day putting strain on your heart like it's it's not great i can get away with it at this age but i don't want to be doing it two three years from now so i, I love the a lot of the young guys now man and 26 as well just going back to that that's outrageous i interviewed eric wood yesterday and he's 27 and i love the talent that's coming into the new york pro like it's so cool that we've got a ton of young guys where in past years, sometimes we're seeing maybe one guy in their 20s in a lineup and then everyone else is in their 30s or 40s. So I love seeing all mm. this new talent come through. And honestly, I'm a little bit surprised how much talent has come through to the IFB Pro League in the open bodybuilding because I thought with the introduction of classic physique, we'd see more guys in their 20s, at least being in classic physique, and maybe some would move over to open bodybuilding. But it seems like everyone... With this new class, everyone still wants to make that progression, even if they do start in classic. You know, you see guys moving from classic now to open, and it's, well, it's, not it's everyone. Like deeper, not everyone. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of new guys. You know, again, like uh, Eric uh, Martin. There's there's a couple of other guys who are Thomas. coming up. Who, yeah, I I think he's like 29 or 30. He's a little older. He's been in oh, graduate yeah. school for like forever. He's he's actually a wicked smart guy. Um, yeah, but. You know, I, I think the vast majority of people getting into this sport still, they don't want to get open bodybuilding big. You know, they're, they're getting pro cars in classic when they're 22, 23, 24. And then, you know, maybe they get to the top of their weight cap in, in like pro classic, but like they don't have the structure or the shape to be winning shows there. Because um, it's like, honestly, if everyone's got the same weight cap, like it's a genetics contest in my opinion. It's like everyone's pretty much in shape because they got to make that weight weight cap, and then it's like, you know, who has the better flow and shape? And um, for that reason, I'm not really a fan of the the classic division just because it's like, I like it when you have a guy who's maybe not got the most gifts, but he's just huge and peeled, and he beats guys that he shouldn't. You know, that those are the kinds of bodybuilders that I look up to personally. Uh, and even if I do have like good shape, like I should, I still look up to the guys who don't have all those gifts because like, those are the guys you should em emulate if you're trying to be the best competitor that you can, you know, the guys yeah. who can't get away with shit, who don't have, you know, corners they can cut. Um, they got to do everything they can to, to win. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, there's always going to be a certain slice of weirdos <laughs> you know, young, old, whatever, who just want to get really big. And, you know, there's enough of them coming into the open ranks now that, you know, we do have some young guys who will likely be winning shows. You know, I am, you know, everybody has opinions on judging, but I am so pissed that Martin did not win a show last year. He was like 
so close. Arguably could have won Texas. I mean, like I, I'm just a huge fan of his physique, and I, I like him. He's a, he's a good dude. So, uh, yeah. but you know, Martin, that guy. I should... want to say this as well, dude. Martin gets a bad rap, but behind the scenes, he has been one of the nicest people to me man like he is yeah he's reached out to me you know i've got some stuff going on in life and he'll reach out to me and you know see if i'm okay and the words he says to me are genuinely very very nice so i, I just want to say that on record as well because he gets a bad rap um because he has had those like little outbursts and done a few things and said a few little wrong things and it's sort of blown up in his face a bit but um but yeah you mentioned how hunter labrada gets you know he's got really shit on you know what i mean in bodybuilding yeah. media online with comments you know it's sort of the media might feed the comments and then he's sort of seen as this villain sort of guy where in reality when i've chatted to hunter um and when i've objectively seen him through the years because i've been a fan for a long time uh, of bodybuilding and obviously of him he seems like a good dude he seems like he has good morals uh seems like his he's dad very, has a great influence on him but he's a very he's good guy shit on yeah yeah He's, um, I think he just gets a bad rap because of his dad. You know, everyone's just like, oh, he's daddy's boy. He gets gifts because of that. Like, no, he's actually busting his ass. And, you know, he's he's trying to be the best in the world. And maybe he should lay off. Same goes for Sergio. Same goes for a lot of these guys. Like, you, if you're not in the pro league, you know, with all of these eyes on you. And I, I, I'm brand new to this, right? So I'm not really, I can't really speak to it. But, like you don't know what it's like when everybody's commenting on your physique and where you should have placed. And like, I'm going to personally have to get over the the point where I'm like reading all the comments that people leave. Cause it's just, eventually you won't care. Bro. Uh, eventually yeah, you yeah. Even doing, I got to chuckle man, at it now, but yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you you, you eventually it. become numb to it, man. It's, it's just like exposure therapy. And if you think about it, like, <laughs> I think Martin's to that point now where he just doesn't care as well. But at first, like he's obviously triggered. And that's what I find yeah. most young guys that get into it, they see these comments and it's hard because being on YouTube as well, YouTube comments are normally pretty brutal. Um, yeah. So even under <laughs> yes. videos, I've heard, you know, if I've interviewed a female or they've been on the show, like they sound like a man, gross. I wouldn't touch her. Like, it's like, whoa, like, and I do, I've even yeah. had people to the point of saying, you should kill yourself. And I'm like, that is an intense thing to say but when you think about the reality of who that might be that's a reflection upon themselves and also it's probably a kid who's 14 years old trying to get a reaction so if you think about it in that way like it's someone trying to get a reaction they're trying to trigger you and it does work sometimes like phil heath he he copped and sort of got a bad rap for mm -hmm. responding to fans because he would you know what he was saying was rightfully so it was fair enough you know because but then he gets the rap of like, why would you bother with it, Phil? It's so immature. And then he gets the bad rap, not the person saying the horrible comments. So it's almost, yeah. you just got to sit back. And I, what I try to do is I just diffuse people. And sometimes people will say, oh, this, this video sucks, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll say something. And I just go, I'm like, hey, you know, that's your, you know, I said, appreciate your perspective and what you have to say about it. Um, you know hopefully enjoy the future videos and they normally will come back and be like, dude, I actually love your content, blah, blah, blah. I didn't mean it like that. And, hey, and, man, and all I'm those, just, all those comments like, are good for your algorithm, man. It's, that's it's, what I say. Just, I say, thank you for, for the comment. views. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. So that's what I normally say. Thanks for the comment. And then I might say something back and I'm friendly to them and they don't expect that they, they expect a reaction. So when you kill them yeah. with kindness and then if they're an asshole again, then it's like, okay, well, you're probably going to get blocked or something because I just don't want that drama. But I'm not a big blocker. I normally just try to kill them with kindness and then they come back with, with a nice comment. And then it, it actually makes you feel good. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. I've turned this guy and he might not do that to other people now because the comments aren't nice and it affects everyone differently. But, yeah, it's just my sort of method of doing it. But I know some people will definitely react. <laughs> yeah, just uh, don't don't take the bait, I guess. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good expression, man. Don't take the bait. Now, yeah. dude, I wanted to discuss something with you um, that's probably a little bit deep in some ways as well. And I saw this uh, on your uh, Instagram, and I've actually wondered as well. You've got some um, like some scars on your outer quad there. I want to go back to it. And I saw in a comment someone said it looks like self harm, and you confirmed that. And I asked you before mm. we did this interview if you mind discussing that, and we had we didn't discuss it any further, so I have no idea, but. Um, firstly, before we get into it, I just want to say, you know, considering you've been in that mindset and in that state to, to self-harm and do things like that, the fact that you're at where you're at now, 
is awesome at 26 years of age. But dude, tell me a little bit about it. Um, maybe the mental health struggles and whatnot you've gone through when you went through it and, and where you're at now mentally. Yeah. So, I mean, all of the self-harm that I, I had an issue with was back in high school, like during my uh, like third, third year high school, so junior year. Um, I was in this very rigorous academic program at my high school, um, and I was struggling a lot. I was very sleep deprived. I was, you know, my parents thought I had ADD, and maybe I did. I don't know, but um, I was just chronically depressed, very badly. Um, and you know, I'm not really sure why it kind of manifested as a self harm issue for me. That's just kind of how it happened to play out. Uh, you know. Part of it was kind of like, um, kind of sounds unusual, but like, I I felt like, you know, I wasn't doing great at school. I felt like I was failing here, but like, if I could like hurt myself and like endure that pain, then I could like at least say, yeah, I could do that. I'm tough, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I still don't really understand why I went that route as a coping mechanism. Obviously, not a good one. Um, I eventually ended up in the hospital, uh, when I was in my junior year, um, you know, my parents had found out about it. They took away all the knives in the house. They locked everything up. I found a blowtorch in my, um, in the garage and I just torched my whole right arm here. Um, so I ended up in the burn unit and that was kind of like rock bottom for me. I started seeing a counselor after that. Um, and things turned around a big way, uh, you know, anybody who's dealing with mental health issues, if you can find yourself a very good therapist and develop a good relationship, game changer. It's, it's tough to do to find somebody who you really click with, but I mean, that probably is the only reason I graduated high school, went to college and, you know, and, you know, functional now, you know, it could have gone a very different direction uh, when you hit rock bottom. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, after high school, I had one lapsed in college I, I noticed that the only time that I ever self-harmed uh, was when I was drinking and alone. So uh, eventually I was just like, okay, I just can't, I can't drink. So I just kind of quit cold turkey pretty much. Um, and then I got really into bodybuilding and, you know, in some kind of twisted way, you know, like I was saying earlier, like when you can do something painful to yourself and endure it and prove that you did that, like what is bodybuilding? <laughs> it's 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 kind of a different flavor of the same thing um and i it has not been an issue to me for me since then since i've really gotten into the sport uh seriously uh, i think the last time i did it was seven six and a half or seven years ago now um so you know i i'm i'm, I'm glad that i found this outlet you know bodybuilding is not the healthiest thing in the world either you know uh internally externally you can hurt yourself you can um it's not the best for your health either um but you know i think it's better than the alternative <laughs> for sure yeah. uh and it's been an effective coping mechanism for me it's allowed me to be successful in something um with, you know, I, I found my thing. I'm not, I'm, I'm lucky, you know, not everybody finds their thing, uh, early in life. Like I did, you know? Um, so it, it, I think the sport has been critical in me not having those issues anymore. And also just, you know, getting better at making friends and developing relationships and, you know, learning how to talk to people. Cause like that, you know, guys are not good at doing that. <laughs> Um, I think we're, we're all guilty of like shutting down and, you know, bottling stuff up sometimes and yeah, you know, maybe society tells us to do that, but it's, it's not the right thing to do. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, whoever you can, therapist, whatever, because, you know, the alternative is really bad. Um, and you don't want to yeah. go down that path, but yeah, I, I'm in, I'm, ver I'm very lucky. Like I said, that I've found some outlet that I can, you know, put that energy that's that's productive and i can be successful at so yeah and dude it's um firstly thanks for, for talking about that because yeah, talking about things like this can definitely help others i'm sure there's there's numerous people listening to this that have mental health issues or you know maybe even have you know suicidal tendencies 
that will listen to this and go like, this dude is, you know, he went from where he was to standing next to Hunter Labrada on stage about to make his pro <laughs> debut at the New York Pro and like, what a story. And you maybe don't, uh, what do I say? Like you maybe don't comprehend that because you're in it as much. Cause I know a lot of guys when I speak to you because your peers and a lot of people you would talk to would be other IFB pros. So it seems very normal, but where you're at mm. now is, is a massive achievement so far. And obviously you've got a lot more ahead of you. So that's awesome. And dude, I resonated with certain parts of what you said for sure, because I've, you know, I've been through some things in my life, you know, I had a partner of four years pass away from cancer and things like that. And, you know, after that, I was going out with my mates on the weekend and drinking, but it was to a point where I would want to drink more and more because you want to just numb yourself and then just let go. You know what I mean? You want to get out of that, any sort of thinking about where your life's at, whether it's, you know, whether it's through loss, whether it's through financial difficulty, whether it's through whatever drama you're having in your life, like you said, with school and all the pressures and things like that. And there's a lot of social pressures, um, school pressures, all that sort of stuff. So it's sometimes there's, there's, there. there's tons no of out. unhealthy coping mechanisms to choose from. You shouldn't choose them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's, I got to a point where I was drinking, you know, every weekend, which doesn't sound like a lot. It wasn't every day or anything like that, but the I next thought day, the Australians I was, just did that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one of those things. <laughs> it's, it's a, we yeah. have a very big drinking culture, but um, probably not the best outlet for sure. But um, no. then I got back more into my bodybuilding, more into training. And people, you know, like you said, people shit on bodybuilding and say it's so unhealthy, it's so bad for you. But maybe without bodybuilding, maybe you wouldn't be alive today. You, you don't know that. You don't know either way. But I know several people where bodybuilding has saved their life in that regard. Oh, yeah. Like, the, yes. the number of yeah. drug addicts, like recovered drug addicts that I knew from like the various gyms that I've been to over the years, it's like, wow, lifting something as silly as eating chicken and like lifting weights. Maybe they're not even competitive bodybuilders. They just like, they like training because it's an outlet and it prevents them from relapsing. Um, mm. And I, I mean, I kind of saw myself harm thing as like, okay, I have this issue. It's never really going to go away, but I can't relapse, you know? And that's how I frame it in my head. Like I need to keep things in place so that I don't, you know, go back to these unhealthy ways of doing things. Um, yeah. And, you know, if, it, if that does it for you, then fucking A, good for you. I mean, you found something. And bodybuilding adds a level of structure to your life as well. And something I've found, yeah. like I'm very productive if I set timers. Like if I've got to get a few things done around the house, I'm like 15 minute time ago, try to get it all done in 15 minutes. It's a weird thing that just helps me with productivity. But uh, like you can even just set it up, be like, okay, well, I'm having five meals today. I've got two and a half hours or three hours between this meal. What am I going to get achieved in that period of time? And you've got to have the meals at the sort of, you know, somewhat similar times. And it just adds that level of structure to your day. And that helps me, yeah. you know, working from home, doing my own work. It's like, I could literally slack off for three hours, no worries, you know, and, and find that very easy. But if I feel like I've gone meal to meal and haven't got shit done, whether it's something productive in terms of resting or bodybuilding or, you know, going to the gym or whatever, or, you know, getting tons of work done, then I feel like that's not an ideal use of my time. So it definitely adds structure to your life. Uh, it's a discipline. You learn from it. And there are a lot of positives to bodybuilding. And is there more mentally unstable people in bodybuilding than not in bodybuilding? Probably, but it, yeah, might, be yeah. the effect, it might be the effect that they were worse before yeah. they got into bodybuilding. And then they Chicken found bodybuilding the egg, in yeah. there. Exactly, chicken on the egg. And I've, I've actually, dude, I, I think about stuff very deep about things like that. And I've thought about that a lot. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think honestly, bodybuilding has obviously for some people probably been a negative, but I think for many, it's actually a, a big positive. And uh, I love that you actually pointed that out, man. But um, I wanted to actually discuss with you, your partner, um, you, she's getting pretty jacked. So she, what is, what's she doing, man? Um, yeah, she's actually, she was going to do a show this year, but her prep went haywire uh i mean like you know she was doing two hours of cardio and eating thin air and just like it, she wasn't losing any weight you know um but yeah she's got a you know that's that's megan just that's my girlfriend you know she's been um she's been training for like close to a decade now and uh you know trying to get her on stage she just started working with my coach blue uh recently so uh it's probably going to try and compete sometime next year after a productive off season. 
get her eating a lot of food, you know, put some muscle on her quads and on her back. And, um, you know, she's got the, the frame there to like kick ass. She just got to put it together. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that because when, when the time finally comes, she's, she's got the tools, you know, and she knows it. Um, she, she worked her ass off this year trying to get in shape, um, for this show, but it just, you know, it just wasn't set up properly before the prep and everything. So. Yeah. Also, I love this photo, dude. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> like candid. Yeah. Uh, yeah, speaking cool. of, of Megan, she's actually about to pick me up from work. We carpool every day. I'm sorry to cut you like this. Um, no, I, no real, man. So next week, uh, I'm taking the whole week off uh, before the New York. So like we can jump on here again if you want. I'll, I'll have ton yeah, of free man. time. I'll just be killing time and trying to relax. You yeah. Know, so. Absolutely, man. I didn't actually check my messages when I said how long have you got, so you probably told me the yeah. other thing, but um, a little no, lower, it's all right. That. But um, dude, thank you so much for coming on here. It's uh, much appreciated. And if you want to jump on a pod or do a last minute interview prior to the to the show or anything like that, um, we can definitely tee that up and get that done because it's been awesome talking yeah. to you. And you're a very very easy interview, so it's much appreciated from me. But um, dude, do you have any sponsors or anything you want to uh, thank before we wrap this thing up? uh no i might in the near future but we'll we'll see what happens there so uh Hopefully. and if yeah. they want to hit you up uh they can contact you through instagram and whatnot as well it's just beef stew on there so dude thank right, you yeah. so much for coming on desktop bodybuilding one once again for another one-on-one -on -one interview make sure you tune into the new york pro and subscribe and hit the notification bell button uh, on desktop bodybuilding for all your 2023 new york pro coverage so that's it for myself xavier wills stuart St subland aka beef stew on instagram for us, we are. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed this one on one interview. And if you did, make sure you give the video a thumbs up, smash that like button, also subscribe and hit the notification bell button. That way, you'll be notified of all future one on one interviews that go up here on Desktop Bodybuilding. Also, we've got Bodybuilding University, which is our podcast, which features guys like Brett Wilkin, Martin Fitzwater, Nathan D'Asher, Stanimal, Stan Delonjou, and then we've had guests like Urs Kalachinski, Nick Walker, and a whole bunch of other big names as well. So make sure you check that out. And uh, if you do subscribe as well, you'll be getting the daily Bodybuilding News Live. So definitely subscribe and hit that notification bell button and uh, join all the content that's coming in 2023 from myself, Xavier Wills here at Desktop Bodybuilding. But anyway, guys, that's it for this video. Desktop Bodybuilding, I'm Xavier Wills, we are out.